Hey guys, it's Denise here, Nola Collectibles, and welcome to my channel. Today I'm going to do something a little bit different. I am going to do a fabulous finds video. So I'm going to share with you some of my recent fabulous finds, whether that be via Shop Goodwill Blue Box or Shop Goodwill Lots or thrift store trips or antique store hauls, whatever it might be. Uh, some of the stuff I haven't shared with you previously, and these are all kind of recent finds within the last couple of months. If you're new here, welcome. My name is Denise Nola Collectibles. I am a part-time reseller. I sell primarily on eBay, and my store name there is also Nola Collectibles. So I'm going to get right into it because, you know, we don't like looking at blank space, of course. And so the first piece I did want to share with you here was this Victorian bar brooch. And so uh, this Victorian bar brooch was something that I did pull out of a recent thrift store bag and I, I get these thrift store bags they're $40 and um, you know sometimes I get nothing and sometimes I score really big and so this you know I say that this is Victorian um, you may say where where are the seed pearls or maybe um, it doesn't look as elaborate as some Victorian jewelry the, the Victorian era spanned 63 years. So this was during the reign of Queen Victoria from 1837 until 1901. And when you think about the context of like the jewelry that came from that era, it had three different kind of categories. You know, there was the high Victorian era, there was the romantic period, and then of course, uh, there was the late Victorian era. So the late Victorian era was definitely one that was more reflective of simpler designs and styles. Whereas, you know, something like the um, Romantic period, reflective of when Queen Victoria and Prince, Prince Albert, um, were in love with each other and, you know, the, the jewelry was a direct reflection of that. Or High Victorian, you know, we're talking more like morning jewelry styles or, you know, that black jet and some of those things that you might associate with the era. So this here, you know, this is set in 14 karat gold. It has a, a fairly large Ceylon blue sapphire right in the middle there. And so I, I found this and, you know, I did kind of, you know, to me, it, it, it very immediately looked like fine jewelry. And, and that stone is pretty superior. If you can look at it right there, it's a really beautiful cut on that stone. And so, you know, I did... I thought initially that it had to be, a, to me, this looks like a sapphire. So I, t I did take out my presidium and I tested it and it did in fact test as a sapphire. And so, you know, I don't know if you also know this or not, like sapphire, sapphire comes in a range of colors. You can find yellow sapphires, you can find pink sapphires. Ceylon sa sapphire is one that is very much characterized by almost like a purplish hue to it, almost similar to like a tanzanite. And another thing I saw when I looked at this, I looked at the stone under my loop, I did see that there were feather inclusions in the stone. So similar to a diamond, a sapphire will have feather, could have feather inclusions in it. And so that's quite a sizable stone right there. It's almost like about, I would say about like a four carat stone. And this was just absolutely stunning. It has the C-clasp um, closure on it right there. It is unfortunately missing the pin back on it. So I do as a follow up have to take it to a jeweler and see what I'm going to do about that. Um, but it is just absolutely a stunning piece of jewelry, a very old piece of jewelry, and just one that I was very, very excited to find. You can see there it has the safety clasp on it too, which is also um, very typical of these of these style of bar brooches where you know you will pin this just as a safety measure so that if you you know if the if the uh, brooch comes undone, you won't lose the piece of jewelry. So. That was very, very cool. And that was literally um, probably about a month ago or so that I found that piece of jewelry. And then from there, you know, I wanna cover kind of like a whole bunch of things and I'm gonna try to go in era. Um, I'm gonna tr try to go in the, um, in the order of era. So let's move now into a couple of pieces I found here. These were really, really beautiful. This one I actually found yesterday. And this one I found about a month ago as well. And these two here are just Czech jewelry, Czech jewelry pieces from the Art Nouveau period. And so uh, when we're looking at, you know, the, some of the Victorian motifs versus Art Nouveau, of course, you know, all of the typical things you look for in Art Nouveau design, organic, swirling, foliate themes, leaves, nature, those types of things, very typical of what you would find in Art Nouveau stylings. And so this um, also set in brass right here, you can see, and with the Czech glass and the um, kind of componentry coming out of the Czech Republic, they were making uh, glass stones to mimic that of fine jewelry, fine fine stone. So I think this is definitely a better example of it. As you can see, it's almost the same color there as that sapphire, and it's a beautiful cut here. And so this one, 
This one you can see has very predominantly that nature theme. It's got the leaves or the fruit and swirling motif in the back. Also has a C clasp here. You know, the C clasp, when they tell you how to date brooches, uh, you're looking at C clasp from 1890 to about the early 1900s. So that would make it an Art Nouveau specific era there that would be correct to the um, era of what we think it is. Um, with a C clasp there. And so I have that guy, which I do love, really, really pretty. That came out of a Shop Goodwill lot. I bid on a lot online and it was actually, I think, labeled like costume jewelry or something like that. And that little dude popped out of there. This one came out of my local thrift store bag as well. And so um, with this one, when I say, you know, nature, you can see there's, um, when you look closely at it, there was what looks like fish um, there. So that swirling design, the fish, the koi, the orient orientalism, also very kind of common design motif um, for Art Nouveau period. I've, I have a, a set of can candelabras, they're pink glass, and they have koi at the base of the glass. Um, so yes, very much um, of that era as well. And so very beautiful, put that one right there. So really lovely couple of set of brooches right there. And like I said, I'm gonna try to kind of go in order here of the era of which they came from. And so we're gonna swing on briefly to the United States. Also, out of the bag that that came from, this piece came, popped out as well. And I thought that this was a very interesting piece. I'm like, what is that? <laughs> it caught my eye. I thought, you know, it looks like, this to me looks, um, you know, when you see those illustrations from the turn of the century. I'm like, is this a legitimate illustration from the turn of the century? And on the back, this is what the back looks like. You can see it's a, a copper kind of tin uh, back right there and it's hooked onto two pieces it looks like. On the back it is it is labeled stamped Whitehead and Hogue, Newark, New Jersey. So Whitehead and Hogue was actually the nation's first button manufacturing company. So super, super interesting. I thought when I looked into this piece a little bit further to kind of learn more, uh, I found it so cool that this was the first button manufacturing company in the United States. And basically they positioned themselves as like the best advertising medium at the time. <laughs> um, you know, because you could put anything on a button and they're generally pretty low cost. Uh, so, you know, it was used very much so for advertising medium and their first kind of like large order that they received as a company was from the American Tobacco Company. And so they would make these buttons that you, when you went to go purchase your pack of cigarettes, you would get a button as well. And so this one you can see here, it's depicting, like I said, it does kind of seem like a turn of the century illustration. The handshake is often indicative of fraternal organization. So you think of Freemasons specifically, or you think of the order of the odd fellows. There's another one that I found that's from the Order of the Odd Fellows, and instead of a handshake, it's a fist bump, which I thought was hysterical. <laughs> the, to think that the Order of the Odd Fellows maybe introduced the fist bump into society just made me laugh. Um, <laughs> but anyway, yeah, this is um, manufactured onto copper, and then it does have celluloid. This white kind of stuff right here is celluloid. And so um, we're looking at probably like 1892 or so on that one. And we're looking probably like at a value of uh, 55 to 75. So this one, just because it is a, a little bit more on the larger side and it depicts kind of a little bit of a different type of manufacturing for, I mean, manufacturing, a different type of advertising for a fraternal organization um, puts the value on this one a little bit higher. But you will see like regular commercial buttons by this company, um, Whitehead and Hogue, and they will go for, you know, less money. But they are collectible. People are very into them. It's definitely a piece of Americana, a piece of our country's history. And, you know, once they kind of introduced the button, like I said, it, it exploded and soon there were button manufacturers all over the country. And of course, um, specifically during pres presidential campaigns, they became very, very popular. Oh, I did want to go back really quick to kind of some of these check pieces in, in the brass. Um, another example of that is this bracelet that I have on here. And you can kind of see this one is more kind of straddling the line of Art Nouveau and Art Deco. And you can see why. And while it still has some of the foliate themes of leaves and whatnot, the lines are a little bit more angular. So that's, you know, typically a little bit more indicative in Art Deco, but definitely straddles the line there for sure. And you can kind of see the bridge of the gap between the different eras right there. 
And so, um, really quick, this one was a really pretty one. I'm gonna fit this guy in really, really quickly as well. This is another good example of uh, a Czech piece of jewelry, Czech manufactured jewelry. And then, and the timing we're looking at on this one is the 1920s. So uh, really beautiful piece of jewelry. I honestly, I can't remember. No, this did come out of a, a local thrift store bag. It was very dirty. I went in and I, I cleaned the rhinestone, the glass up. Um, and I tend to do that when I do that. It's very sparkly now when I found it was very, very dull. Um, but I use alcohol because alcohol will uh, quickly dry. So with any kind of piece of old jewelry, especially if it's set into metal, you don't want to expose it to water. The water water is the enemy <laughs> of these old pieces of jewelry. So I will use alcohol, usually on a Q-tip. I'll just go in and clean the stones. And I think it cleaned up really, really beautifully. And as you can see here, we do have like a little bit of an open back setting on some of these guys, which really lets the light in. Really, really beautiful on this one. I love this piece of jewelry here. And similar kind of styles like this tend to go for about $165. So I'd say like $125 to $165. Really just gorgeous. And again, you can see there's that continuation in Czech manufacturing of making glass and rhinestones that look like real gemstones. And in this case, amethyst. So really, really pretty. I think that that's very, very fabulous as well. And of course, you know, <laughs> this is one of my favorite errors. I love Art Nouveau, I love Art Deco. I think a lot of people share that passion as well for those styles of jewelry. So it's, it's no surprise here that I'm showing you these pieces. So what is I do think is surprising as we're kind of talking about some of these different errors of jewelry, we can come right into Bakelite. And so I recently um, got a lot from Shop Goodwill there, it wasn't a vintage lot. I, again, I want to say it was just kind of a, a mixed jewelry lot. I'm going to push some of these guys aside, but I still would like to see them. Let's keep them in view if we can. All these pretties. Um, it was just labeled as a mixed costume jewelry, and clearly someone donated their someone had donated their Bakelite collection, which. To me is just so sad like how can someone donate this collection but i mean sad but good because guess what they ended up in the right home <laughs> and all of this was in the same lot and so we have some here which i just think is so stunning this really beautiful kind of deeply carved um spinach bakelite piece here it's hinged and really just a stunning gorgeous piece of bakelite and so bakelite was something that is also popular during the Art Deco period, which you don't think about um, Bakelite being the same as coming from some of those, you know, more refined kind of Art Deco looking jewelry pieces. But, um, you know, definitely around since 1909 to the 1940s, um, Dr. Leo Bakeland invented this in the 1900s. And so, of course, its original purpose was not for jewelry manufacturing. It was something I believe that we use in, in electrical way, in some kind of like electrical, electrical manufacturing purpose because it cooled quickly and it did not melt. So um, when you think about the height of Bakelite jewelry, we're looking at about the 1930s. And so these were really fine examples, really beautiful. I like the dimension, the dimension of this one specifically that it kind of looks like almost like pyramid studs, right? And um, this one as well with a nice kind of rounded square cut look to it. They're just absolutely beautiful. And I've, um, you know, in the past, I wasn't like the biggest Bakelite lover, but I think you know, my tastes have definitely evolved and I, I see the beauty in it. And like a stack of Bakelite bangles just really looks fabulous. It reminds me of like Iris Apfel, <laughs> you know, just gorgeous stacks of bangles, um, you know. And so these are really, really lovely. The, the more intricate they are, the higher they are in value. And so the, the most valuable one here is obviously this very intricately carved clamper. And, and then this one, I would say probably secondly, and then this kind of squared one. Thirdly, and so these are what we call kind of spinach bakelite. I would like, I should probably keep these in frame too. Spinach bakelite, due to that color, that coloration that literally looks kind of like cream spinach. And then we have these here as well. And um, this one, really, really pretty. I like the fact that this is kind of like 
um, a thin kind of flat type of bangle and these two I think definitely went together and so we have more of kind of like a butterscotch color there on that one and so with Bakelite uh, I like to use a lot of people talk about different testing methods how they like to authenticate Bakelite I do like to use Simichrome so I get a tube of Simichrome and you can get them on Amazon it's like I want to say it's like eight bucks and um it's super easy. You just put it on a Q-tip and you just eye rub it on the inside of the bangle bracelet in an inconspicuous spot and it will turn kind of a, a yellow, a yellow orange and it's reacting to the chemical compounds in the Bakelite. So very easy to test. I've heard 409 formula works as well. I cannot personally attest to that. I have not tried that, but I, I heard it well. I have, I've heard conflicting things that they changed the formula and it's no longer a good way to test. And some people claim it's still a good way to test. So I, I'm not sure, like I said, I haven't used that. I'll stick with the Simicrone. And yeah, that's, a, that's my um, little grouping of Bakelite that I got. Recently at the thrift store, you know me, I like to go to my local thrift store. I went into my thrift store and I saw this guy in the case. And so, you know, there's so much contemporary jewelry that we see today and which is like most of what we see at the thrift store. It's strange to me to see something like this. And I saw this and I almost questioned like, is this contemporary? Is this, <laughs> is this, um, you know, something that's meant to look like Art Deco or is this legitimate Art Deco jewelry? And so I looked on it, I opened it up. It opens like this. It has like a little hinge right there. You can see um, it was $9.99 and it was on sale for half price. It has a little hinge right there. And there's actually also patent information on it. Let me see where the patent is. Okay, the patent is right in the middle of the bracelet. You can kind of see it's stamped right there. So it had some patent information on it and it had a sign I was unfamiliar with. It is a W in an upside down triangle. I did some research on the patent because to me the patent was more legible than the logo or the manufacturer's mark and I found that this is JJ White Jewelry. And so JJ White Jewelry was founded in 1896 and they actually produced jewelry up until the 70s, um, but very, very well known for this Art Deco style of jewelry. And so very, um, I think very indicative here of Art Deco when you see the open filigree, very detailed. We have a two-tone metal here. It's not a stone in the middle. It's actually glass that's meant to look like a stone, but I think this is absolutely stunning. It's in excellent condition. And if you are an Art Deco lover and you possibly can't afford all of the beautiful platinum, <laughs> 18 karat and 14 karat gold pieces of jewelry, I would recommend looking up JJ White Jewelry. It's not dirt cheap, but something like this will give you a quintessential Art Deco look for less money. So for something like this, we're talking more in the range of $125 to $150. And like I said, I mean, this to me doesn't get much more Art Deco than this. And they make stunning designs. So one is prettier than the next. And I just thought this was a super rare find, but such a beautiful find and one that really surprised me. So gorgeous in my local thrift store um, just most recently. So I add that there. This I'm also, this was also a thrift store find. I'm going to be careful with this because I don't have a pin bottom for it. And you can see here, this one was marked at $3.99. And so this to me, I grabbed it because it looked, it just looks very old. And you can see here, it does, it, it looks like it may have the beginnings of a verdigree. I, I may have to clean it um, or see what's going on there. But even so, this is just, like I said, it looked very old to me. And on the back, there's a cartouche and it says, Stanley Hagler, New York City. Hagler, Stanley Hagler, Stanley Hagler, New York City. And so when you look at this, or when I look at this, what what does this look like to you? To me, this looks very much in the style of Miriam Haskell. She's known for kind of putting these pieces on the back of her jewelry to secure all of the delicate filigree and wire work that she does with her beads. And so when I pick this up, I'm like, hmm, this is interesting, but it kind of reminded me of Miriam Haskell jewelry. And so I did a little research there, which is wonderful when jewelry is marked. It gives you such a good starting point. Um, I looked it up really quickly and I found out, found out that Stanley Hagler, Hagler 
did in fact work for Miriam Haskell. <laughs> so he worked with Miriam Haskell in the 1940s and right around 1953, he went off on his own and he created his own line of jewelry. And so I will say this is not what I would consider maybe the most quintessential piece of, of his jewelry. It looks like Miriam Haskell jewelry. It has very elaborate seed bead, tiny beads, you know, faux pearls, a lot of the aspects of Miriam Haskell jewelry and it sells for um, a lot of money. So I would suggest, you know, if this is something you might be interested in or if you're a Haskell fan, maybe look into it. it it will maybe make your head explode. <laughs> it made mine explode a little bit um, just because they're gorgeous. And it was sold in very fine upscale department stores at the time. So we're talking places like Saks Fifth Avenue, Lord & Taylor, those New York department stores, even Bergdorf Goodman. And so, yeah, that was um, a little bit very interesting right there. I don't think, like I said, I don't think that this is the quintessential and necessarily um, of the most value, but I'm not going to leave, you know, something like that in the thrift store that deserves to come home with me because it's cool and different and interesting and old. Um, I'm going to go right here. This was something that came out of my local thrift store recently, thrift store jewelry bag as well. And this one definitely kind of threw me for a loop. Um, I saw this and I said, what am I looking at here? Is this a Victorian era piece um, because it has some of the elements there, the seed beads, stuff like that, the seed beads. I'm like, am I looking at amethyst? Is this carved amethyst? I wasn't quite sure to be completely honest. Um, and then we, but we have, I think what we have here is brass. And then we have this very large barrel clasp here. So you guys know with me, one way I like to research jewelry is I will pop it into my light box and then I'll take a photo and I'll do a search on it. And what I saw, well, the light firstly kind of illuminated and allowed me to see something that I didn't necessarily see with my naked eye. And that was right here on the end of the barrel of the clasp there. It is marked um, made in France. So that gave me a starting point to start, start searching for what could possibly be this jewelry. And so what I arrived at was a jewelry manufacturer based in France, Louis Rousselot. Rousselet, Rousselet. Um, so he was a French jewelry designer who basically studied uh, lamp work, glass bead work. And really his whole specialty was like these beautiful carved glass beads, all handmade, hand polished, and very typical of his jewelry is barrel clasp closures, very similar to this, and they will all be marked made in France. And so, you know, he began manufacturing in 1922, uh, but the business went till about 1965. He had a daughter, Denise, and she kind of took over the business um, when he passed. But, you know, you can see this is very gorgeous. It's very collectible, um, really just stunning, handmade jewelry from France. And with this, in the same, you know, in the same bag, because people were donating um, probably from the same household, was also this pair of earrings, which I believe also to be um, Louis Rousselet. So these are beautifully carved, again, um, glass, purple glass here, obviously meant to replicate and look like amethyst. Um, but here, some of the design elements, the metal looks very similar. Some of the kind of end caps are very similar to what we're seeing here. And then we have a little bit of a beautiful kind of pearl detail on them too. So within that same bag of jewelry that whoever donated um, was also a matching pair of earrings. So really, I didn't know what this was. I'm sharing this with you, <laughs> you know, in hopes that we can educate each other here. But because once I did kind of discover what it was and I did the, the good research, I, I was pretty excited. But, you know, it, it looks like a, a fantastic piece of jewelry. This is you know, this comes out of a thrift store jewelry bag, which is sometimes filled with barrettes and hair ties and um, key rings <laughs> and shoelaces and paper clips. And you see something like this, um, a, a really, you know, old, handmade, high quality piece of jewelry and something your brain goes off and you're like, I have to, this is special, I have to put this aside. So that's basically what I did. I put it aside until I could um, research it and found the information and that's um, really how I'll rule. I'll keep working at something until I find the information for it. So that was really, really exciting to me to find um, that matching set. Um, from a new to me kind of manufacturer, jewelry manufacturer that's very collectible.
So super cool on that one. Uh, this one you guys saw recently in one of my videos, and this is um, an Elsa Scaparelli bracelet. And Elsa Scaparelli, you know, she was a couture designer and she was born in Rome, Italy. She was, and I said this previously, she's very known for kind of like hanging around with that surrealist scene, Salvador Dali. <laughs> um, she was very um, inspired by the surrealist at the time, you know, when people were coming out little black dresses, very refined, chic silhouettes, she introduced the shocking pink dress. And this was 100% a moment in fashion. And so, you know, and it was a kind of a blend between a magenta and a fuchsia. So you can just imagine, given the time frame, you know, the uh, 1940s, what kind of impact that might have made in, in the fashion industry. Anyway, from clothing manufacturing in her maison, she went to, to jewelry manufacture right around 1949. And Elsa Scaparelli, Elsa she moved from France, from her maison in France to New York City. And that's kind of really when the, she started the manufacture of costume jewelry. She ended up licensing, licensing her name to someone who manufactured on her behalf, but of course maintained kind of creative uh, license over everything and the designs and, and what she wanted to be made. She incorporated that shocking pink color into a lot of her jewelry as well. Also very indicative, um, she, you know, she had faux tourmalines, she had lava rocks, she had huge big chunky stones, very similar to this. So this really is um, very much a signature Scaparelli bracelet right here. And so I was very excited to find this. This one came out of a thrift store jewelry bag. I can't remember, what, it was a huge lot. I wanna say it was like one of those 16 pound lots. Um, type of thing. So I was really excited to find this. I've actually never find a piece of Scaparelli um, jewelry. And so I will need to continue kind of like to do research on this to figure out what kind of pricing. But I think I, I want to say I did see kind of 325, 350, 375 um, kind of range right there. So very exciting as well, just to find, again, I love to find different jewelry brands. And so you guys know it would not, I would not be, it would not be me if I didn't get into the Native American jewelry as well. I do love Native American jewelry. And I think I had mentioned this previously, I have been doing a little bit of sourcing at a Buffalo Exchange. And so I don't know if you're familiar with Buffalo Exchange. Um, it's basically like, a, it's like a store for like kind of college age kids and early 20 somethings <laughs> to go and thrift clothing. <laughs> so I always go in there and I feel like the, I'm always like the oldest person there. <laughs> <laughs> but it's good for me because I'm like, these kids are not looking for what I'm looking and they have amazing jewelry for very good prices. So I found recently this piece of, um, this piece of jewelry right here. You can see this is a giant kind of onyx cuff, sterling silver. And I took, a, I took a look at it and it is a piece of signed jewelry. And you can see right there, it says Peterson Johnson Navajo <clears throat> sterling. Peterson Johnson was um, definitely known. He was a self-taught Navajo sterling silversmith, and he was cre started creating jewelry in the late 1970s, so 1976, and then continued creating jewelry there. And so what um, what is typical of more Navajo, when you're thinking about Native, Native American jewelry and you're comparing, say, Zuni-style jewelry to Navajo, Navajo is definitely known for being bold and chunky. So like those bigger, chunkier, turquoise pieces or like you see right here this one with this large onyx stone and so yes this is just a really beautifully finely made piece of navajo jewelry with a great um cuff just a, a, a great piece of jewelry cuff with a big chunky onyx there and so something like that goes for about i'd say about 200, 225 250 something like along those ranges and then similarly also from the buffalo, buffalo exchange I think, I think someone is selling their Native American jewelry collection. So I also found this, and this is just a beautifully, absolutely gorgeously made piece of jewelry. This one is also signed and it says, let me see if I can zoom in, at least focus. See there, it says um, D. Cadman Sterling. And um, Cadman, there's several Cadmans. Uh, D. Cadman is Daryl. There's also Donovan Cadman and there's Andy Cadman and they're all in the same family. They're brothers and they're all um, Navajo silversmiths. And they, um, 
this is more contemporary. It's actually, they started making jewelry in the early 90s, so about 1992 or so, but this is really finely made and it's super heavy. And you can see it's just beautifully intricate. And we have some gorgeous Sleeping Beauty turquoise, which is that Robin's Ed blue turquoise. And also, um, what is that purple stone? Rhodonite? No. I'm blanking on that one right now, you guys. <laughs> but, um, Rhodochrosite? I forget. You all will tell me. But yeah, it's a great piece of jewelry. And this one was $20. And I picked this up at the Buffalo Exchange. So, you know, the kids, quote unquote, the kids might be shopping there, but this lady's cleaning up house like a bandit. Um, <laughs> anyway, so that's everything, you guys. I really, like I said, I wanted to just talk through some of these like cool different brands um, I'm finding and wanted to just share them with you and, you know, give you some of the history. I've done the work, so I want to share that work with you. Let me know what you think. Let me know what your favorite pieces were. You know what? If you have a particular era of jewelry that speaks to your soul, Tell me what that is. I, I'd love to hear it and like tell me why. You know, I, I think jewelry has such sentimental value to it. Part a huge part of it, and I think why we love it is just the sentiment sentimentality that's attached to so much of it. So I appreciate you guys tuning in and um, staying on this journey with me, being on this journey with me. I hope you all are having a great weekend. Give me a like on the way out. It really helps to grow my channel. Subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you guys at the next one. Bye.